Well, here is a sum that brings three themes together and shows us how those three themes are actually related to one another. The, the three, th three, three themes that we can see from this psalm is the theme of prayer, the theme of praise, and the theme of missions. And in case you will miss everything that I will say, but here is the one thing that I would like you to remember and take away with. The main point that the psalmist simply makes in this psalm is this. That as God's people, we invoke God's favor upon us to enable us to reach out to all nations with the gospel that they, meaning those all nations, that they in praise may be glad and sing for joy. <coughs> I, will say it, I will say it again. As God's people, we invoke God's favor upon us to enable us to reach all nations with the gospel that they in praise to God may be glad and sing for joy. As a matter of fact, the psalm that we are considering this afternoon is a celebratory psalm. It is a jovial song or a psalm. It is a psalm that is a prayer to God, a prayer that God's blessings to Israel would bring God's blessings to all peoples or to all nations. And as you closely, as you closely observe this psalm, um, you actually see that perhaps a bountiful harvest was the immediate occasion as indicated for us in verse 6. But yet, the abundant crop was only an example, an example of God's goodness to Israel. The mission of Israel to the nations to bestow, the bestower of blessings through a people specially blessed was the wider concern. In other words, that as you look at this psalm and as you study it, and as you look at it closely, you actually see that the mission of Israel to all the nations, the bestower of blessings upon this nation that God had chosen to himself to use it as a missionary nation, in order that all other nations and all other peoples then would also be blessed, that is the concern that we see in the psalm that we are studying together. As we take time then to study this psalm, just two things I would like to bring to your attention. Number one, it is the invocation of the psalmist, and then number two, it is the doxology of the psalmist. So let's begin by looking at the invocation of the psalmist. Now, for the sake of my good friends who are in the scholars program, uh, an invocation is simply a request for help or forgiveness made to God. That that petition, that request that is made to God for help and for forgiveness is what is known as an invocation. And particularly in the passage that we are considering, and especially verse 1 and 2, the psalmist is making a request. He is making a petition to God for a blessing on the nation of Israel. Observe with me two things about this invocation. Number one, it is the petition for a blessing. The petition for a blessing. This is actually, as you can see, this is actually, an, an, it is an allusion to the mosaic blessing that is recorded in number six and verse 24. In other words, that if you look at what the psalmist says in the passage we are considering from verse one and two, you actually see how closely related this passage is actually to Numbers and chapter 6 when God commands the priests uh, that this is how they were to bless the nation of Israel. And so verse 1 and 2 shows us, shows us 
the petition, the petition for a blessing that the psalmist is bringing out in here. And you actually see that there are three statements that the psalmist is making to petition God for this blessing. Three statements that he makes. Statement number one is what we find in the first part of verse one. He says, may God be gracious to us. The us, it is the nation of Israel that he has in mind here. And, thus, and so the psalmist says, may God be gracious to us. In other words, may God show Israel his favor. Or may God have mercy on Israel as other versions would render this section of the verse. Statement number two is found in the second part of verse one and the first part of verse seven. And the psalmist says, and, and, and not only may God be gracious to us, but may he also bless us. And then in the first part of verse seven, he says, may God bless us still. To bless, as we all know, to bless is God's act of bestowing a gift or a favor thereby bringing gladness or bringing joy and happiness. It is the appeal to God for his favor upon a person. But statement number three, it is what we find in the third part of verse one, and there the psalmist says, and make his face shine upon us. May God be gracious to us. And not only may he be gracious, may he bless us. And he doesn't end there further. The psalmist petitions God and he says, may, may God make his face shine on us. Well, what does he mean here when he petitions God to make his face shine on the nation? Notice that this is simply a picture of God as Father, smiling and taking pleasure on his children. And that is what the psalmist wishes upon the nation of Israel, that God may look with blessing, that God may look with favor, that God may look with mercy, undeserved favor upon this nation. Well, in this invocation, not only does, does the psalmist here bring out the petition for a blessing, but notice also the reason for the blessing. The reason for the blessing. In other words, if we ask the question, why should God bless Israel? If we turn to the psalmist and say, okay, what is it then? Why should God bless Israel? Well, you notice that the psalmist gives us two reasons. Two reasons as to why God must bless Israel, or two reasons why the psalmist actually petitions God for this blessing. Reason number one, it is for the proclamation and publicity of God's redemptive work to all nations. In other words, that the reason as to why the psalmist petitions God, the psalmist asks God to bless Israel, to look with favor and grace and mercy and bestow that which this nation doesn't deserve. It is for the sake of the proclamation, the sake of the spread, and publicity of God's redemptive work to all nations on earth. Listen to verse 2. He says, may God be gracious to us, if I read the whole of verse 2, I mean, uh, starting from verse 1, he says, may God be gracious to us and bless us and make his face shine on us. To what end? Why? Listen to verse 2. He says, so that your ways may be known on earth your salvation among all nations. In other words, the reason as to why the psalmist so desires 
that the blessing of God may be upon this nation Israel, that the grace of God and mercy, that the smile of God may be upon this nation. The psalmist says is so that then as this nation endeavors to fulfill that role, that responsibility that is upon this nation to be a missionary nation, that as this nation endeavors then to spread, to herald, to proclaim, to publicize God's redemptive work, that this effort may not in any way be in vain. Because after all, God has first of all not only chosen, but he has also blessed this nation. And so, why should God bless Israel? Well, number one, it is for the, it is for the proclamation and publicity of God's redemptive work to all nations, because you actually see, he says that in order that the, that the ways of God may be known on earth, and then there is a comma to clarify what he means, he then shows us your salvation among all nations. In other words, that the salvation of God, this work, this desire of God to reconcile man to himself, that it may be known to all the nations that are on earth. But there's a second reason. There's a second reason it is for the repentance of all nations. For the repentance of all nations. That not only that the salvation of God may be, may be publicized, may be proclaimed, that it may be spread, it may be spread, but that also these nations, as they hear that message, as they receive that message, as they come into contact with the message of God's salvation, that they may respond. They may respond to turn away from wickedness to God. In other words, for all nations to return to God, or it is for the drawing of all peoples of the earth to God. In the second part of verse 7, I'll read all of verse 7, but the emphasis is on the second part of verse 7. He says, may God bless us still. May God bless us still, and why? He says, so that all the ends of the earth will fear him. God bless us so that all the ends of the earth will fear God. Now, what does he mean here? And especially when he uses the phrase, fear him, fear God. Well, if we borrow the meaning from Proverbs 8 and verse 13, the, the, the core idea, the basic idea behind the phrase to fear God, it's simply to shun evil to hurt evil, to turn away from that which is wicked. And so what the psalmist has in mind here is that when God blesses Israel, and as Israel launches out to proclaim the salvation of God, that all nations then may learn to fear God, that all nations may learn to turn away from wickedness, to shun evil, to hurt evil, and pursue righteousness with God. So why should God bless Israel? Well, number one, it is for the proclamation and publicity of God's redemptive work to all nations. And number two, it is for the repentance of all nations. The return of all nations. The drawing of all the peoples to God. So that's the invocation, that's the prayer that the psalmist simply gives to God for a blessing and he has shown us the reason behind why he is petitioning God for that blessing. But let me move on to my second point and that is the, dex the, the, dox the doxology, pardon me, the doxology of the psalmist. 
and Esnat is looking at me and wondering, what is this man saying? <laughs> a, dos a doxology is simply a word of praise. That's what it is. From the Greek word doxa, which simply means glory or praise. And what we see here is that the psalmist, after he has offered this prayer, after he has petitioned God, after he has invoked God, he then bursts into a word of praise. And that is what we see from verse 3 up to verse 6. Now, two things. Two things I'd like you to see in this word of praise, in this doxology, just two things. Number one, notice the declaration of praise. The declaration of praise. Now, as we read this declaration of praise, please take note of the feature that those who study literature refer to as parallelism. And parallelism is simply that device that poets would use to state something one way and then state it in another way using different words but still communicating the same idea. Notice verse 3, verse 4a, and verse 5. So verse 3a says, May the peoples praise you, God. Verse 3b, may all the peoples praise you. Verse 4, may the nations be glad and sing for joy. Verse 5a, may the peoples praise you, God. Verse 5b, may all the peoples praise you. And all that repetition is simply to emphasize this. May God be praised. Amen? Amen. May God be be glorified. And that is the point that the psalmist is simply making here. May God be praised. May God be glorified. But there's a reason. There's a reason as to why God must be glorified. It is actually a pattern that you will see if you study the psalms, that uh, what the psalmist will do when he states a praise, he will also give us the reason as to why we must praise God. And that, is what we, and that is what he does here. After declaring that praise, stating that praise, he then shows us the reason as to why we must praise God. In other words, why should the peoples and nations praise God? And the psalmist gives us two reasons. Two reasons as to why the nations and peoples must praise God. Reason number one, it is because of his fair and just governance. Because of God's fair and just governance. In other words, that in the way that God governs the entire world, in the way that he drives all the events and activities of the world, he does it with fairness and justice and uprightness. In the second part of verse 4, the psalmist will say, For you, referring to God, for you rule the peoples with equity, with equity and guide the nations on earth. And that word equity simply means fairness and uprightness. And so because God, in the way that he drives the affairs of the world, in the way that he governs, in the way that he rules, the psalmist shows us that he does it with equity, he does it with fairness, uprightness, he does it with justice, and for that, all nations must praise God. All the peoples of the earth must praise God. God. But reason number two, it is because of God's provision. It is because of God's provision. In verse 6, the psalmist will say, The land yields its harvest. God, our God, blesses us. The land 
yields its harvest, God, our God, blesses us. In other words, that, that the reason as to why all the peoples and all the nations should praise God, it is, not, it is not just because God governs the world with fairness and uprightness, but it is also because of the abundance of provision that God provides this world. And so verse 6, the psalmist says, the land yields its harvest. God, our God, blesses us. And for that, and for that, may the peoples praise you, O God. Well, but we must draw some lessons before we can conclude we must draw some lessons. What is it that we learn from the invocation that the psalmist gives to God? What is it that we learn from the doxology or from the word of praise that the psalmist offers to God? Well, four lessons and we will be done. Lesson number one, it is the obligation of the church to pray the obligation of the church to prayer. In other words, that in prayer, we must beseech God to bestow his grace upon us, first of all, before we can launch out to be his witnesses. That as we, as we are aware of the responsibility that is before us, the work, the marching orders that are before us as a church, the great commission that he has, that God has given us, that before we launch out, we must give ourselves to prayer. And as we pray, we beseech God. As we pray, we plead with God that his grace may be upon us. We plead with him that his blessings may be upon us. Because if we launch out without the hand of God upon us, if we launch out without God's grace upon us, our efforts will be in vain. And you know, the Lord Jesus Christ actually, um, in a sense, cautions his disciples in, in Acts chapter 1 and verse, verse, verse 18. I mean, verse, verse 8. The Lord Jesus Christ says, well, it is when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and when you have received power from above, that then you will be my witnesses. In other words, that when it comes to the work that God has given us, the Holy Spirit is an indispensable resource. And that is, that, that is what the psalmist is showing us here. First of all, there is an invocation beseeching God for his grace, for his mercy, for his blessings to be upon this nation that God has chosen to be a missionary nation. And we learn as a church today that we have a duty to pray. We have the obligation to pray. And as we do that, we simply beseech God to bestow his grace upon us. Well, Jesus Christ tells us that without me or apart from me, there is nothing that we can do not so. Lesson number two, it is the obligation of the church to missions. The whole premise, the whole premise that we pray to God appealing for his grace, appealing for his favor, is simply because of this ministry of reconciliation that God has entrusted unto us. This enterprise of missions that God has entrusted unto us. And so, yes, the connection is that, look, as we pray, as we pray, our prayer is simply oriented 
towards this responsibility that God has given us, that even as we launch out, as we go out, as we reach out to other nations, that indeed our efforts may be fruitful because the favor and grace of God is upon us. And so this psalm in a sense shows us the obligation that we have as a church in regard to missions in the same way that this obligation was on the nation of Israel towards all nations. But lesson number three, it is the goal of missions. It is the goal of missions. In other words, to what end do we spread the good news of God's salvation to all nations? If you think about it, to what end do we beseech God for his grace? And, and to what end then do we go out? Well, according to this psalm, it is so that God can be feared and be worshipped by all the peoples of the earth. That's the whole goal. That all the peoples of the earth, that all nations on earth may learn what it means to fear God and to worship him. You actually, you actually get this sense if you discern the chain of thought, the chain of thought of the psalmist in our passage. If you start reading from verse 1, listen, he says, May God be gracious to us and bless us and make his face shine on us, verse 2, so that your ways may be known on earth, your salvation among all nations. May the peoples praise you, God. May all the peoples praise you. May the nations be glad and sing for joy, for you rule the peoples with equity and guide the nations uh, of the earth. Verse 5, may the peoples praise you, O God. May all the peoples praise you. The land yields its harvest. God, our God, blesses us. May God bless us still so that all the ends of the earth will fear him. Clearly, from this psalm, from every tongue and from every tribe and nation, this multitude that simply fears and worships God. Doesn't that give you the picture of the harvest at the close of history in Revelation when that multitude stands before the throne of God made up with people that are drawn from every tribe, every tongue, and every nation on earth, now redeemed and standing before the throne of God, harvested, having been harvested from the world. And this is what the psalmist shows us here. But the last lesson number four, it is the concern for the non-believer and their invitation to come to God. The concern for the non-believer and their invitation to come to God. Notice that both the invocation that the psalmist gives and the, do the doxology that the psalmist gives in this psalm, they are all pointed towards one thing. Towards that person. That person who is not yet a child of God. That person who is not yet a Christian. It is God's desire that through evangelistic and missionary campaigns of the church that you seated there and listening, you're not yet a child of God, not yet, not yet a Christian. It is God's desire that through these evangelistic and missionary campaigns, that through these you may also be brought into the fold of God that you may also be brought into this covenant community with God so that also you can praise God and sing for joy as the psalmist has shown us here. And so it is our prayer then as we close that you will look to the way, the truth, and the life, Jesus Christ himself, whom God has provided
for you to come into relationship with him. Amen.